The 99-year-old rolling lift single leaf bascule Galveston Causeway Railroad Bridge was known to be the most dangerous bridge on the Intracoastal Waterway. In addition to its narrow 108-foot width, mariners had to negotiate a significant curve in the waterway on either side of the bridge while facing strong south-to-north winds and east-to-west tidal currents in the area. More accidents occurred as a result of collisions with this railroad bridge than any other on the Gulf Coast, costing more than $2 million annually. The U.S. Coast Guard deemed the bridge a navigational hazard and directed the bridge to be replaced. The highway bridge was widened to a 310-foot clearance, and it was deemed the railroad bridge would be widened to the same distance, nearly tripling its overall width. Chinbro and Brassfield and Gorey came together as a joint venture and won the contract for the bridge replacement. Due to the size of the bridge and the location of its final destination, the new single track vertical lift span bridge was constructed on land at a site approximately three miles from the channel. Burkhalter was subcontracted for the rigging and precision setting of the new bridge as well as the lifting and removal of the existing bascule bridge. Burkhalter's submission for SCNRA's rigging job of the year is for the rigging portion of this job only, which started at winch line connection for setting of the new lift span bridge and ended at winch line detachment during bascule bridge removal. The new lift span bridge was 386 feet 8 inches long by 22 feet 9 inches wide and 64 feet 8 inches high. The bridge weighed 3 million pounds. The old bascule bridge was 153 feet long, 22 feet 8 inches wide, and 56 feet 6 inches high. The bridge weighed 1,700,000 pounds. Rig and position the new lift span bridge and set on its supports. Rig, lift from its supports, and remove the existing bascule bridge. The bridge was to be positioned between two control towers already in place. Horizontally, there was approximately two and a half inches of clearance on either side of the bridge. The bridge must come in perfectly aligned, square, and level to fit in place. Additionally, when the new bridge was on its center line, there was only 17 inches between it and the old bridge. If control of the barge was not maintained, the new bridge could easily collide with the old bridge. The impact of the 3 million pound lift span bridge could not only damage both bridges, but would knock the raised bascule bridge off its pivot point so that it could not be later lowered for impending rail traffic. So we have this huge bridge, a railroad bridge. It's almost 400 feet long. It weighs over three million pounds and we have two and a half inches of clearance on both sides. Quite, quite a tight fit when you consider 400 feet and is on a barge and got 300 feet hanging off the barge. Uh, so we had to come in perfectly square and level for it to ever clear. Uh, at, at that point we had to also be concerned about the existing bascule bridge that had been lowered to a 30 degree angle and then one of the two pinions had to be removed before you could gain clearance for the new bridge. It also put it in a vulnerable position. If we bumped it ever so slightly, it could be disastrous. So we had to be extremely careful to make sure that didn't happen as well. Gas lines run directly underneath the channel as do the water lines that supply all of Galveston with water. The barge could not be too deep or we would hit the lines, not only causing damage to the gas and water lines themselves, but posing safety hazards, environmental threats, and the potential to knock out all of Galveston's water supply. The colossal bridge was 287 feet wider than the barge. While the barge was clearly inside the channel, Burkhalter had to make sure that the bottom of the bridge would not hit the tops of the existing structures, including the dolphins and the rail itself. The goal was to vertically clear the structures, but not by much, since pumping that much water in and out of the barge took a considerable amount of time that we didn't have. The vertical clearance between the bottom of the bridge and the top of the railroad was a meager nine inches. 
which brings us to the next challenge. When considering vertical clearances in the intercoastal waterway, a fundamental element to be aware of is the tide level. Burkhalter had to constantly monitor the tide and engineered their rigging process using the tidal charts. The tide directly affected the vertical clearances of existing dolphins and the railway, as well as the barge ballasting requirements to set the new lift span bridge and to lift the existing bascule bridge. Once the new bridge was in place and the process of removing the old bridge began, the tide played a huge factor in the ability to pass underneath the new lift span bridge. Burkhalter had to contend with strong east to west tidal currents in the channel during the positioning and setting of the bridge. Once the bridge was in position, it had to be held there for three hours while the bridge was lowered and connected. Strong southern winds are common on the intercoastal waterway. What exactly is a strong wind? One that can blow off a hard hat, as we experienced during the pre-rigging stages. Not only had Burkhalter crews seen firsthand the strength of this coastal wind, we now had a 65-foot tall bridge sitting on a barge in the middle of the channel that had the ability to act as a giant sail. Preparation was key for safety and for the success of the job. A number of additional tie-downs were used to secure the bridge from wind gust, and the overall precision rigging plan accounted for the wind presence. As if it wasn't challenging enough to position a 387-foot bridge precisely square with five inches of horizontal clearance while avoiding existing structures and gas lines and dealing with all of Mother Nature's factors, this all had to be done against the clock. So in setting this bridge, we were operating under a firm fixed price contract. And in addition to that, there were liquidated damages if we exceeded our allotted time for setting the bridge onto its foundations. Our client had two 12-hour windows for rail closures with the BNSF Railroad, and they had severe penalties if they did not meet those times. Of that 12 hours on setting the new bridge, we only had seven hours to accomplish all our tasks. And then as we removed the old bridge, we only had five hours. So it was critical that we meet our time frames uh, because it was gonna cost us uh, money per hour if we exceeded those times. In addition, we had a bonus if we beat those times. Our clients' numbers were greater than that, and of course we want to continue to do business with them, so it was of utmost important, importance to us to make sure that we met those windows. The client originally approached us with their plan to use a 250 by 72 barge with a, a lead-in on the towers to catch the bridge as it came in. And we approached them with an idea to use a 300 by 100 barge because we knew it would offer greater stability and it would allow us to use a rub rail based off of the existing channel so that we could use the barge as the guide instead of the bridge. In order to accurately control the bridge and precisely set it in place, we designed a four-point mooring system. This system consisted of two double drum waterfall winches, one placed at the rear and one placed at the front of the barge. The two rear lines were used for propulsion and the two front lines were used for braking. And the two rear lines were connected to existing dolphins on either side of the channel and the two front lines were connected to existing structure on the south side. Once these mooring lines were in place, the tugboats went idle and the winches took total control. As always, safety is essential and the focus here was no different. Burkhalter always follows a one-time right philosophy, which was crucial in this job since there was only one opportunity to get it right. The key to the one-time right philosophy is having both sound execution and safety plans and a commitment to follow those plans. Burkhalter's safety plan and procedures consisted of a number of additional layers on this job due to the nature of the job and the number of agencies involved. Obviously, OSHA is always a presence, but this job added the U.S. Coast Guard, BNSF Railroad, the RailSafe Program, and the Joint Ventures Programs, in addition to Burkhalter's safety program. With this number of agencies involved, all with their own policies and procedures, the chance for the rules to get convoluted was pretty high. But in this situation, as in others, crews followed the most stringent of the policies 
in order to comply with all rules and regulations set forth. Although Burkhalter wasn't working specifically on the rail line itself, the rules were still applicable. Each crew member, or Burkhalter employee, had to take a RailSafe class, pass a test, and receive RailSafe certification before working on site. In addition, they went through safety orientations with the joint venture and with BNSF. Open communication was required with BNSF's railroad flagman, who in turn was in communication with the trains. This flagman had to approve all activities done near the rail, even if that was simply walking across the tracks. Standard personal protective equipment was worn by all crew during the job, including hard hats, safety glasses, and steel toe boots. Each crew member was also outfitted with a high visibility safety flotation vest that was in accordance with railroad specific colors, materials, and design. A temporary barrier was installed around the perimeter of the barge. When working outside of this barrier, crew were required to tie off a full body harness to the rat line that ran six feet around the edge of the barge. As part of the rigging and final placement of the massive bridge on its bearings, it was crucial that the center line of the bridge was precisely positioned on the barge. The placement was based upon field surveys of the barge and the channel center lines. Since the center line of the new bridge was not the same as the center line of the existing channel, Burkhalter was required to come in offset. On February 14th, Burkhalter began lining up the barge for the winch alignment. 20-foot chokers were located at the securement points to expedite the attachment of the mooring lines to the anchors. Making positive attachments to the securement points was critical given the extremely limited time window. The bridge was constantly monitored and trimmed by ballasting to keep it level as it approached. Utilizing the four-point mooring system, the bridge was minutely controlled and positioned, final to prior set. Once the bridge was in position, 2.9 million gallons of water were used to ballast the barge and lower the bridge onto its supports, utilizing 10 6-inch ballast pumps. During this process, the mooring system was continually adjusted to maintain precise alignment of the bridge. Once the bridge was set, Burkhalter continued the ballasting process to provide clearance under the bridge, at which point the mooring lines were detached and the tugboats moved the barge outside of the channel before the seven-hour time window expired. Removal of the barge allowed the joint venture access to continue their operations in preparing the new bridge for commission and preparing the bascule bridge for removal. It also allowed the bascule bridge to be lowered and rail traffic to resume. Within minutes of Burkhalter's timely exit from the channel, scheduled rail traffic was once again crossing the old Bascule Bridge. Rail transit had resumed, and the new lift span bridge was in place, but the job was not yet complete. The existing Bascule Bridge still had to be removed from the site. When it came to removing the old bridge, the customer's initial plan was to dismantle it in place, but with tight time constraints and environmental concerns, this didn't seem possible. Another critical issue is that a bascule bridge, by design, the center of gravity is off to one side and not even located over the channel, literally making it impossible to move without repositioning the center of gravity or dismantling it altogether. We proposed several solutions for the customer to remove this bridge, the first of which involved basically cutting it into two pieces, leaving the counterweights on shore and we would take the rest of the bridge out on top of our transporters on the barge. This, this rose some environmental concerns. We don't know what a, all paint is on it. We don't know what happens to all the metal that gets cut over uh, an existing waterway. The second option consisted of bringing in extra counterweights and placing them at the toe of the bridge. This would relocate the center of gravity closer to the center of the bridge where we could access it with our transporters on the barge. But the problem is you're increasing the weight of the, of the total bridge and you've got to source counterweights. And the third and final solution that we actually used was to take existing counterweights out of the bascule bridge and have them relocated onto the toe of the bridge on a frame that would distribute the load evenly 
This relocated the center of gravity approximately 45 feet, allowing us to capture it with our trailers. The transporters were reconfigured on the barge outside of the channel, and the barge re-entered the channel for the lift of the bascule bridge. When the second rail closure commenced, we repositioned the barge and reattached the four-point mooring system following the same procedures utilized during the installation of the new bridge span. Once the barge was positioned under the bridge, the last of the counterweights were relocated under Burkhalter's direction and Burkhalter began ballasting the barge to lift the 1.7 million pound bridge from its supports. Continual ballasting allowed crews to move the 56 foot tall bascule bridge underneath the raised lift span to complete its removal from the site. We worked many hours with our client to develop plans that would suit their needs and suit our needs as well. Uh, our engineers and project managers did an exceptional job in, in executing a great plan. Uh, we set the new bridge within the allotted time. We made some bonus. We took the old bridge out in less than the allotted time, and that was good for us and good for our client. We, you know, we executed a very good plan. Brian Watson, just uh, calling to congratulate you on a job well done today. Uh, uh, very impressive. I did just exactly what you said you would do, and uh, and I really appreciate it. And on behalf of all of us here at the Joint Venture, I just wanted to say thank you. Burkhalter successfully completed the job as required by the firm fixed price contract. The job was completed safely and on time with no injuries, delays, or property damage. Successfully completed the precision rigging and setting of the new lift span bridge in under the seven hour allotted time window. Successfully completed the rigging and removal of the bascule bridge in under the five hour time window. Burkhalter overcame narrow horizontal and vertical clearances navigated around existing structures, including gas lines and water lines, safely and successfully controlled the bridges throughout currents, tides, and strong winds, worked within extremely narrow time frames and within predetermined rail transit schedules. Burkhalter engineered a four-point mooring system to precisely guide the bridge into place. We utilized existing channel structures and the rub rail as a barge guide. We engineered a solution to remove the existing bascule bridge by moving the center of gravity 45 feet, which was still 13 feet from the center.